Okay, we're live. Very good morning, everybody. Welcome to this first session today. I'm Stephen Jan, I'll be chairing the session. And we have today six presentations. Uh, our first presentation is a demo given by Roger Dean uh, entitled The Multi-Tuned Piano, Keyboard Music Without a Tuning System Generated Manually or by Deep Improviser. Roger, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm somebody who's not totally wedded to either the octave or fixed ratio tuning intervals, having all pitch intervals be the same. Rather, I'm quite interested in microtuning, and I recognize that there are a few tuning systems which don't actually use octaves. For example, the Boland Pierce system is the most famous in Western studies. And I developed a whole a family of tuning systems in 2009 which don't use either ratio intervals, which are retained in Bowl and Pierce, and don't have any octaves. So I'm quite interested in the idea of using continuous tuning systems, not only on instruments for which it's obviously an easy possibility, like string instruments, but also for a virtual piano. So I want to show you some uh, pieces I've been making and the approaches involved. I should be able to go to the next slide, but it doesn't want to go to the next slide. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. Okay, so one of the pieces I'm going to show you involves the use of a machine learning model, and I just want to summarize this deep improviser of mine, which is uh, focused on post-tonal and post-metrical music, by which I mean music which may well retain tonality and metricality, but doesn't depend on it, may often be rather different. So I have a rather simple um, deep, deep net here involving a couple of convolutional layers, an attentional layer, and a regression output at the end after the recurrent network. And I've developed this primarily from the point of view of music generation rather than from the point of view of um, maximum fit of the predictions. I have it predicting the next event, but I want to use it for generative purposes. So I've got a somewhat unusual um, custom error function, custom loss, which involves both pattern retention and preservation kind of competing against minimizing error. So I'm going to show you um, briefly, let you hear briefly, four, four pieces. They're each less than a minute or around about 40 to 60 seconds. And they show different aspects of how to use or how I'm finding it interesting to use continuous pitch in different contexts. The first one uh, involves using the inside of the piano to extend the timbre and the range of pitches which are possible, and there are also noises, nearly all of which are intentional. But about halfway through, you'll hear the virtual piano with microtunings. This is done with Pianotech and a special interface to allow the preservation of, of individual pitches discreetly um, and their off, on and off effects. You'll hear that coming in about halfway through.
And now an algorithmic sonification. I'll probably just play you a bit of this. This has two strands sonifying world versus COVID data during the first two months, which is the first epoch in Australia. And you'll have noticed some interesting psychoacoustic bends, which are um, not entirely programmed. Here's a demonstration of the interface that I use for manual playing. And as some of you will be able to tell, that's using Max and Mira together with an iPad. And finally, this is actually a machine-generated piece. Um, it's a really micro piece, but this is just one segment of it. The piece actually goes for about three minutes. And you'll hear various post-minimal repetitivenesses, which are partly due to the way I sampled the, the model. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. And just looking at the Slack channel, which our viewers can use to ask questions. Um, I don't see that there are any questions just yet. Uh, perhaps I could ask you, um, perhaps it's an old chestnut question. Um, but the more sophisticated we become at exploring microtonal space and microrhythmic space, I guess the greater the demands that are placed on cognition to form mental representations of this music. Does your system give um, the human listener um, a scaffolding or a framework within which to, to, to cognize this music? Is there any sort of what? What is there any sort of uh, attention paid for learned habits of perception and cognition and innate frameworks of perception and cognition? There's nothing of that built into the the deep net model that I have. No, but I think that the way one produces the music as a performer, and then of course one can curate mu machine learned music as well. The way one does that involves those kind of sensitivities which are personal to the composer or improviser, but at the same time they reflect those cognitive, uh, if you like, limitations. And so I think that one does learn, or I, I believe I've been doing this for a few months recently, I believe one does learn some of the features which will be clues. After all, it's difficult to work out what the real features of a piece of music are whenever you hear it for the first time almost whatever genre it is. I don't know that this is really any more difficult. Thank you. Uh, I see we have a question from Sandra, who is asking, what was the COVID data? Was it daily cases or something else? It was daily uh, new cases 
And there were two strands in the sonification, one of which was effectively the world scaled to its maximum, and the other was effectively Australia scaled to its maximum, but they occupied different pitch registers in the whole spectrum. Do you plan to use other bodies of COVID related data for future future work? Well, I made a complete piece. I mean, it's about seven minutes, the actual piece. I just played you an extract, of course. I was thinking I would probably do one more in the optimistic hope that the second cycle in Australia is the last major cycle. But I, I think I might hold my horses a little while before doing that. Uh -huh. um, I don't see any more questions, Roger. You have kind of left your, your contact detail. So um, viewers can look at that and, and ask you further questions if they occur to them. So Roger, thank you very much indeed for a really interesting presentation. Thank you very much. So we move on now to uh, a paper by Stefano Colonaris and Anna Aldenaki entitled Meet the Curve, a language-based approach to generative music systems in Croatia. Thank you, Stefano. Oh, can everyone can you hear me okay? Yes, can we cross clearly? Thank you. Great. Because um, I'm not uh, looking at the chat, so if anything goes wrong, please give me a verbal cue. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's involved in making this happen. It's such a great conference and a pleasure to be part of it. Um, it's Japan here, so it's uh, just gone uh, past five. And I'll be talking about a seemingly novel um, method that we came up with, uh, Anna. Um, so the evaluation of um, generative music system is a difficult task. And that's not a uh, secret. And uh, it's no surprise that because it involves uh, consideration of on musicology, mathematics, uh, and psychology, aesthetics, uh, little consensus has been uh, reached to date on uh, standardized procedures. In general, one would want to um, balance or combine formative assessments with the necessity to put generative music output back to the domain experts realm. And so this paper presents our contribution on this topic where we foreground the role of uh, human-based evaluation and we strive to integrate it with the uh, objective and automatic metrics in one generalizable procedure. This procedure was uh, originally proposed in the paper cited in this slide, which just uh, been presented is near last week. And the context is the modeling of composition of two part polyphony as a machine translation problem. Uh, so generating a musical part, a target, given another source. In uh, that study, we used a transformer and performed a hyperparameter optimization and selected models which favored automatic metrics common in NLP, natural language um, processing. Sometimes different metrics pointed at the same architecture, so we were able to combine those models and uh, select finally uh, five of those. Apart from the base one, uh, which is the architecture made famous in the Attention Zone You Need paper, the rest are, are ACPLE, which stands for uh, Token Accuracy and Blue. So the, the architecture pointed, um, so favored by those two metrics. The Loss Rouge, which is the architecture favored by um, Loss, which is cross entropy, and Rouge. Uh, best PPL, which is PPL stands for perplexity, and best where, where, where stands for word error rate. Uh, all these seem to produce comparable results. And so it was not possible to select the best model on the basis of automatic metrics alone. And that was the motivation for us to correlate uh, automatic metrics to human judgment and to come up with a novel metric which we call HER, human uh, targeted edit rate. 
which in turn is inspired by the human target translation edit rate, uh, an automatic translation metric, which roughly goes like this. Human annotators are given a source sentence, the machine generated translation, which we will call hypothesis from now on, and one or more reference translations. Then they edit the hypothesis until it has the same meaning of one of the references. Subsequently, the translation error rate shown in the formula here is calculated by normalizing the number of edits that were applied by the average word length of the references. So there is a problem in applying directly the HT to, to a music domain. Um, the main problem being uh, semantics. So linguistic and musical meanings are fundamentally unlike each other. And then there is the problem of the um, one or several um, uh, reference sentences. So unless one were to use um, pieces with, with more than two parts, or uh, then we would have to, one would have to compose them ad hoc. So to circumvent these problems, we propose the following. Step one, annotators are given the source sentence and the hypothesis from the, from the model. Based on their domain expertise, so they all have to be domain experts, they edit directly the hypothesis until it is sufficiently appropriate as a musical complement to the source. Annotators are specifically instructed to apply the minimum number of necessary edits that guarantee them a satisfactory musical result. And here you can see the, um, this procedure shown for two annotators. You can see that, of course, that it's a subjective judgment. And the second, up to, to, to an extent, and the se second annotator is perhaps more keen in uh, keeping, keeping with the hypothesis, whether the annotator one takes a bit more freedom. Uh, step number two, the reference target is then compared to the hypothesis by means of some edit. Um, distance measure. Options uh, are the word error rate, which is the one we ended up using, Levenstein distance, the monjol sankov algorithm, and so forth. Then um, one can um, use aggregate functions to report the scores of the systems being evaluated. And lastly, step three is um, to, to report inter-annotated agreement. And for this, one can use kappa or, or alpha family tests or um, correlation coefficients. As a general case, apart from the translation paradigm that we used, one could, could think of uh, the, this procedure um, to be applied uh, you know, outside of this uh, um, translation case uh, by simply removing the source element altogether. So in this scenario, annotators would be given the music output from the system and proceed similarly in editing until sufficiently satisfying according to the domain expertise. So let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons. Uh, her avoids human machine discrimination altogether, which is a pro in my, in my opinion, and explicitly requires domain expertise. And because of this, it is not necessary to define musical features of interest in advance. Um, that doesn't mean that her is devoid of predefined notions or of individual biases. However, th these biases can be smoothed thanks to averaging and controlled by internal annotator reliability tests. Her places no constraint on how the system learns or generates, nor on the bar length or monophonic texture. As for cons, uh, her works on symbolic music, not on raw audio output, unless one mm, applies automatic music transcriptions in, in beforehand. And her assumes the annotators are digitally up to use score editors, uh, which this makes uh, the sourcing and train of annotators more labor intensive. Combined to the domain expertise the constraint, this can further limit her applicability to large scale evaluation exercises Another problem is producing well-designed instructions for the annotators to ensure comparable strategy or aims. And this, this can be challenging and we should consider it more formally in the future. I proceed now to show you the experiment that we, um, that we did with a with, um, neural machine translation counterpoint. 
So we selected 20 matching mini scores between two and six bars long for each model of the five randomly and uh, to be given to annotators. We use the Yandex Toloka crowdsourcing platform to gather annotators. And we invited people with high education in music in the test with questions in harmony and music theory. The successful participants were then invited for a second test when they had to correct the sample score according to her guidelines. Finally, only four participants, uh, four annotators were um, selected. Uh, as for results, these uh, are the hair scores. We use the wear metric as for edit distance. The Los Rouge model uh, scored the best, the lowest mean hair score, while the ACBLO was the worst performer. However, a Friedman test showed that there was no significant differences between all the five groups with N equals A, 20 scores for each of the four annotators. And for certain input scores, the, all the models produced an output that consistently required more edits, which can be seen on the figure in the figure on the right. And the challenging inputs mostly differed in the rhythm. They contain more dots and nodes, more types of duration than the easy inputs. Uh, for example, ACBLO mini score 1747 gets consistently fewer edits. And we assume that's because um, it features a proper counterpoint species and consistent tertiary harmony and strong, excuse me, metrical positions. Conversely, the same model's mini score 2577, which is shown in the left hand side of the slide, led to an unusual number of edits. Here again, we assume that this is due to broken septuplets, where all other models are replied in triplets, and poor harmony, so clusters of major and minor seconds. After calculating the hair scores for each measure of each mini score and averaging over all models and all annotators, we noted that most mini scores, 16 out of 20, the last part of the hypothesis was the most edited. As for the agreement, we used Crippendorf's alpha coefficient and intra-class correlation coefficient for a fixed set of annotators uh, rating each target. All models apart from the Lost Rouge, which had the lowest agreement, uh, ranged between poor to moderate agreement. And Crippendorf alpha and ICC stood um, at uh, not 3.88 and not 4.11 respectively. But when we recalculated on the hair scores normalized per annotator, these values were not 483 and not 61. So based on intra-annotator reliability, there was moderate agreement in deeming the model optimized for perplexity, the more successful, followed by the base model. And there was also similar agreement in judging the ACBLO, the worst performing of all. And as a baseline, we used the Young and Lurch uh, MG eval framework which is a feature-based uh, um, evaluation. And in their exhaustive cross-validation uh, based on intra and inter-set measurements, somewhat confirmed the automatic computation linguistic metrics in that there, was, there weren't significant differences between the models. As for the callback lever divergence and overlap area, both Bayes and ACBLER seem to do consistently better than the rest with best perplexity feature in a couple of metrics too. So in this sense, the her evaluation and MG eval evaluation disagree on the ACBLU model. And it is difficult to compare the results of these two methods because uh, MG eval is based on the notion of similarity between the training corpus and the generated set. And her scores were computed over a handful of tests and MG eval was computed over the whole test set. So Young and Lurch approach is clearly more apt to evaluate set of generations with respect to a training corpus where her um, is particularly suitable for the evaluation of single generations. It should also be noted that features such as PC per bar and C per bar, PCH per bar required a fixed number of bars. So uh, we prevented us from using the MG value in complete form. So to summarize, while her is not devoid of subjective judgments, subjectivity is measured by internal data reliability test, given the possibility to remove unreliable annotators. And we contend that her procedure could be applied to a wide range of generative symbolic systems. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, that was interesting. Uh, should I press continue? Yeah. Mm. 
Yes. Um, so uh, arguably, the her and uh, feature-based uh, evaluation could be used uh, um, um, together rather than in a mutually ex uh, exclusive fashion, as they provide different insights. And uh, we concede that um, her evaluation is um, more concerned with um, acceptability and quality rather than creativity. So uh, according to which she falls in the weak objectives. And that is all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Stefano. Um, we have a question from Robin Laney, uh, who is asking, does the approach favor generative systems that play safe rather than take risks? And is this a problem from a creative perspective? Well, actually, one thing that was missing is, um, you know, the consideration of what what if. I mean, this the annotators um, do the edits according to the their the domain expertise, and so there were the data that we train on is the MCMA, which is bespoke, um, very small but homogeneous data set that we put together of multi-track baroque music. And so the domain experts were experts in in baroque, and they were judging according to, to their expertise. Um, this evaluation didn't, didn't um, consider the case. What if, you know, one of some, some of the output is totally bonkers, but it's, it's, it's you know, deemed uh, nice, cool, great, you know, musical. Um, yeah, that was not part of the, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about how to answer the Robin's question in the sense um, is targeted evaluation to to for the sort of music that you expect the music the, the model to to produce. I, I repeat, it's it, it's more concerned with quality and acceptability rather than the creative aspect of the system. Just on that point, Stefano, does does the approach, does your model control for the fact that um, a given source might have statistically more likely um, target solutions? I'm thinking, for example, of a fugal subject, uh, which which implies a very clear type of answer, which is sort of musicologically correct, versus a more generic phrase that might not be perceived or might not function um, as a potential fugal subject and which might have um, potential, um, potentially very different target responses. Well, uh, in that sense, I mean, th th there's, there's, there's two things that come to my mind. I mean, because we we um, we trained on every um, so it's like an n choose k. They, uh, each each piece um, range between two and six parts, and so because you build all the we build all the pairs of possible you know all the possible pairs of, of tracks. Um, but then we had to make a choice in this, because in in question answering so in translation models you you you. It has to be a unique, a unique um, answer. So we kind of um, device that uh, with a range. So the lowest range. So we always generate the, the lowest, uh, take the the lowest to, to, to be the response. But um, yeah, of course, you could have like in the future it would be very nice to introduce some control whereby um, the, the user could have control over the app and say, give me the translation, so to speak. In, the, in this register or in the other register, um, rather than just having one, one, uh, one target um, only. Um, as for how appropriate that would be, I mean, the annotator is free to, to edit as much as she likes to, to, to bring the, the hypothesis um, down to the, the level that, that is judged appropriate for the, for the, for the, for the for the domain, so if it's if it's not appropriate to, for, to be a counter subject for a fugue, they they are free to edit it as much as they like. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question from Oded. Um, perhaps it would be useful to examine raters' responses when they are asked different questions. Such edit it to be the most correct, uh, edit to be the most inventive, or to be given the aim of the composer and help that composer to achieve that aim. Yes, yes, there's a, there's a lot to be done. This is, was the first time that we thought about this procedure and the first time that we applied it. And certainly there's there's many things that, could, that could, we can improve on. <laughs> and not least, I mean, we, we should have more annotators because because uh, considering the subjectivity of the of the of the task, we, we should start with that um, and then move on to, to also more interesting questions like the ones or that uh, suggests. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jacopo. Um, from your experience, do you think that other evaluation measures from NLP can be used for evaluating music generation systems trained as language models, kind of asking about future work? Yeah, well, that was interesting. I mean, the whole the whole thing was motivated because we 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 decided, OK, let's go NLP all the way. So we used NLP, the neural machine translation as the model for generating the music and for, for understanding two-part counterpoint and for modeling it. So why not go all the way and using automatic translation metrics to evaluate the output? And so that was the motivation. Um, from this study, we concluded, the, you know, if all the, the ones, the automatic metrics that we used um, gave us comparable results. There was no particularly insightful in the sense that what's a good um, automatic metric in this context uh, for, for evaluating music generation systems. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly we, we could keep keep looking at those. Um, but since, yeah, I'm, I, at the moment I'm more interested in, 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 uh, in how her can be, can be um, developed and, and integrated with more automatic metrics to, to make it more feasible for large scale evaluations rather than a targeted one generation. Thank you, Stefan. I think that's, um, that's about time up. I think there, there are no more questions, but, but maybe more will appear. Uh, as we go on. So thank you very much, Stefano. Um, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Our next uh, paper is by Neo, Neo Kazachi, Ayuko Uemura, and Tetsuro Kitahara. Uh, and it will be presented by Aiko. And it's entitled A Piano Ballad Arrangement System. Well, thank you. I'm Aiko Uemura from Nihon University. I'm going to give a presentation instead of first author meal. I'd like to talk about uh, piano part arrangement system. Let's start with background. The piano is one of the most popular instruments in the world, and many commercial scores using popular music are sold to hobby pianists. There are two strategies for piano arrangement. First one is straight piano arrangement. The piano plays the same chords and rhythms as on different instruments, such as the guitar and the bass. The second one is non-straight piano arrangement. For example, many jazz books or bad style pieces with popular songs have been sold. The purpose of this study is to semi-automatically convert a straight piano arrangement into a ballad style piano arrangement. In, an, in one approach, machine learning uh, used to run conversion rules. However, it needs parallel data set. So we manually designed a ballad arrangement rules, BAR, we analyzed ballad style arrangements by professional musicians. 
We analyze the characteristics of a ballad by comparing 94 songs from non ballad piano books and 100 ballad arrangements from piano books. We focused on the accompaniment for the left hand. We analyzed four items broken chords, chords not values, and pitch. We dealt with the full song, the first 24 bars, and the last 24 bars. Firstly, we analyzed broken chords separately as a broken chord type one and type two. For example, a broken chord type one contains arpeggio and type two contains a belty bass. We counted the bars that satisfied each condition. This table shows the proportion of the numbers of bars that apply to broken chords type one and type two. As you can see, the ballad had a higher proportion of words that include all the broken chords. Secondly, we investigate the proportion of the numbers of words in the non barred music and the barred music that contain the chords of a full note, a half note, and so on. We pointed that the barred music uh, had a higher proportion for notes and half notes than the non barred music. Also, quarter note, quarter note chords were usually higher than a higher in the non barred music. Thirdly, we analyzed the note value of the full note, half note, quarter note, and so on. We confirmed that the barred music had a higher proportion of full notes and half notes and than the non barred music. In addition, no, the non barred music was usually higher than the barred music in 16th notes. Finally, we examined uh, the average pitch of all notes with a midi note number. We can see that the average of pitch of barred music was higher than that of the non barred music. Here is a summary of characteristics of ballad style. It contains main, many broken chords, type one, and contains full notes and half notes. It consists of fewer 16 notes and contains high pitched notes. We define the BAR based on this result. Here are some examples of the BRRs. Uh, this is BRR1 example. If we input code on the first beat, uh, sorry. Then we get broken code type one. Well, here is a BAR, for example, if we input chords on the first beat, we'll get full note chord. And here is a BAR6 example. Uh, if we input four consecutive six notes, they are converted into a quarter note. This is VR10 example. When we input notes, we 
will get higher octave notes. The right hand part as well as the left hand part will be an octave higher. Now I will talk about system overview. Uh, when we input an original MIDI file, we'll get ballad arrangement file. The tempo is set to two thirds the tempo of input. We can select mode uh, from manual and automatic arrangement. While arranging a song manually, we can apply a BAR for each bar by clicking cells in the editing area. Our system allows to user to apply multiple BARs to each bar. On the other hand, we set the randomization for each section using automatic arrangement mode. Randomization indicates the number of words to which bar is randomly applied. The higher the scale, uh, the more randomly rule applied to many bars. If the randomization degree is zero, uh, the predefined rules are applied to each bar depending on the section. To evaluate generated score, we extracted the chorus section from the piano scores. We regarded the original scores as method one. Method two is manual arrangement by assigning rules by an author. Method three to five is based on the randomization of zero, 50, and 100. And this is randomization up to 100. We examined the arrangement under these conditions as a set. We prepared six sets. So you can listen to these full length files online. The music scores were evaluated by an expert with a PhD in music. We also gave her MP3 data generated by music score. She evaluated uh, the score while listening to the music based on four metrics, overall playability, naturalness of continuous notes, uh, harmony in the accompaniment, and ballad likeness. Each item was given a score on a scale of one to 10. This table shows a result. First, I'd like to focus on playability. A method two had the highest score. And the expert commented that they were easy to play because the same accompaniment pattern continued. Method four and five uh, scored lower than method one, two, and three. The expert commented that method four and five were difficult to play musically because the harmony was unpleasant. Playability seemed to be affected by whether the simplicity of the same accompaniment pattern continued. Next, I'd like to focus on naturalness of continuous notes Method one had the highest average score and method five had the lowest. The expert commented that method five had a lot of unnatural continuous scores. So we can assume that the code progression in the accompaniment affected continuous notes 
method five lowest because the VARs were applied at random and the scores were converted into strange code progressions. Thirdly, I'd like to pay attention to harmony. We can see here again, method one had the highest score average, average score and method five had the lowest. Regarding method five, the experts commented that the code was unpleasant and the accompaniment pattern suddenly switched. Therefore, code progression and switching the accompaniment pattern seem to be uh, seem to affect the harmony in the accompaniment. However, some scores were low in method one. The expert felt that it was unnatural because the same accompaniment was repeated. Finally, I'd like to talk about bad likeness. Method two had the highest average score and method five had the lowest. The standard deviation for method one was larger than that for method two and three. And for some scores, the rating seemed, seemed to uh, seem better for method one than two. Um, method two had a high score and ex the expert commented that the rhythm pattern of the accompaniment seemed to be a barred. Regarding method five, she commented the chords were unpleasant and the accompaniment pattern uh, was too simple. These results suggest that code progressions and accompaniment patterns also affect the bird likeness. The minor arrangement in method two enable the, the arrangement to be closer to the apparat by letting the user apply the proposed BARs for each row. Let me summarize my talk we propose the system that converts existing popular piano songs into bad style arrangements. Our results showed that the music we generated with the BAR enhanced the ballad likeness. The manual arrangements uh, and the results given the randomization at there had the highest average scores in terms of playability and bad likeness. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Aiko. Uh, we have no questions in the chat just yet. So perhaps I could ask you, um, in your analysis of the, the ballad repertoire, um, <laughs> from which you, sorry, in your analysis of the ballad repertoire from which you extracted the rules, you, you note that the average pitch of the ballad music was higher than non-ballad music. Do you, do you have any hypotheses as to why that might be the case? Sorry, um, I can't hear you. So could you say that again, please? Uh, yeah, hey, looking at your paper and in your presentation, you mentioned that the average pitch of the ballad music was higher than that of the non-ballad music on the bottom of the slide that you're showing. I was just wondering if you had any hypotheses as to why that might be the case. Yes. Uh... When we see the ballad score, some ballad score includes high octave notes like that. So we uh, we made this, this hypothesis and uh, analyze it. Uh, I hope that answers. I guess I was just wondering what is it about the ballad as a style 
that predisposes it to having a higher pitch range than the non-ballad style music. Uh, so your, uh, your question is about uh, the style that uh, uh, it have a higher pitch range than non-ballad style music. Yes, I was just wondering if, if you knew of a reason why that might be the case. Um, perhaps it goes beyond the scope of your of your paper, but it just struck me as an interesting observation about the nature of um, ballad. Uh, Rogers come in suggesting that perhaps the slower tempo might be correlated as the cause of the higher pitch. Perhaps that's something for uh, for future for future work. Yes, in future, um, in uh, I will try the analyze the pitch range, but in this study we <laughs> we dealt with the average of pitch, so we have to check the pitch range. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, we do have time for one more question, if anybody would like to put one in the Slack chat. Perhaps I could, perhaps I could just ask uh, the Slack, there's no further questions. Perhaps um, Aiko, I could just ask, do you have any plans to um, to correct one of the the issues that arises from the randomization? It seems that when you have high levels of randomization, the harmony gets scrambled, doesn't it? You get some, as, as your uh, expert um, witness observed, there is an element of uh, harmonic. Uh, scrambling and some of the chord progressions start to sound a bit unnatural. Do you, do you have any um, plans to try and um, correct that issue when uh, when deploying the higher randomization levels? Yeah, certainly. I can't say that the uh, high randomizations results are perfectly usable, uh, but of course we can pick uh, what we don't like uh, manually. So uh, even if the user has no knowledge of arranging, we expect that they can find their favorite arrangement by listening, listening to the generated example. And, uh, uh, um, so, uh, I'm, um, well, that's, uh, uh, but that's, that's very interesting, Aiki. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really interesting presentation um, and um, some really fascinating transformations of, of the, the non-ballad style into the ballad style. So, Aiko, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. And we move on next uh, to Matthias Rose, Biare and David Meredith's paper entitled Sequence Generative Adversarial Networks for Music Generation with Maximum Entropy Reinforcement Learning. Okay, hi guys. Thank you for your time and listening to me. So yes, I will present uh, the following project, which was uh, came by as a student project by me and supervised by David Meredith. So to set the scene, uh, sequence GAN, uh, sequence generative adversarial network was proposed by the inventor of GAN networks, Goodfellow. And in 2016, um, it was, implemented by UNL on the Nottingham data set. Um, in 2017, Lee et al, they uh, used the same 
method for melody chord generation on the same data set, the notes in hand folk data set, but they report problem of mode drops. And what we tried to do in this project was to improve some of these results of the mode drop and enhance the richness of the samples by using maximum entropy reinforcement learning. So quick to set the scene on what is the mode drop. If we have some data distribution here in green that we try to fit our uh, a generative model distribution uh, to in red, mode drop occurs when we fail to fit some of the modes of the data distribution. So the overall architecture is that we are training a discriminator to learn to distinguish between real samples and fake samples generated by a generator. And this generator is then learning to uh, foil the discriminator. And in ordinary GAN, the generator output is continuous and uh, we can learn to fool the discriminator by backpropagating through the discriminator. However, in sequence scan, the output is discrete sequences of music. And instead, we can learn to fool the discriminator by using reinforcement learning. So how does this work? In, if we consider the generation of music as a generating sequence of tokens from a vocabulary V, we define a Markov decision problem in the following way. So we have a set of state, action, and rewards, and a transition function. And this transition function models the dynamics of the systems. So given a state and an agent that contr uh, controls the environment, it specifies an action, then we transit to a new state and, and a reward is emitted. In our context, the, this function is uh, deterministic. So uh, the actions of our models are simply the tokens of our vocabulary. The states are sequence prefixes of the so far generated sequence, but they are compressed by an L LSTM. Um, the reward function is zero, except for when, we trans when we're completing the full sequence at a fixed uh, time, capital T, and then the reward is given as to how likely is the discriminator thinking this sequence is a real uh, musical piece. So <clears throat> an agent then uh, is controlling this MDP environment according to a policy, which we will learn. So given a state, it can select an action for the next transition. So just to show how it works, we start initially by having created nothing and then the agent selecting an action, here in this case, 442, and it gets a zero reward. Then again, it selects a new action, transits, get a zero, uh, zero reward, all the way until the end where we select an action and get a possibly non-zero reward. So how can we learn to actually uh, foil the discriminator? So we're using two objectives, the ordinary reinforcement learning objective, which is maximizing the rewards of this uh, sample trajectories of our policy. And also we define the maximum entropy reinforcement learning object uh, to maximize the expected reward and entropy. Um, in this context, we will use policies pi, which are differentiable such that we can directly uh, optimize these objective functions with Monte Carlo sampling and gradient descent. So just to show um, how uh, the updates happen, if we are, it is a policy iteration. So if we are at some stage, a pol policy K and we want to update our policy. We first Monte Carlo sample, and then we check our reward function given by the discriminator. 
these samples that are that has a high reward are then getting uh, updated to become more likely. Here in blue, blue is the ordinary reinforced um, policy iteration, and in Cyan is the maximum entropy reinforcement learning uh, update. And we we see that if we are when we are using this CN, the maximum entropy, we will actually make this trajectories more likely, which are less likely to occur under our current policy. So this should give us more diverse samples. So on to our experiments. We trained four different models. Um, one was with ordinary cross entropy minimization as a baseline. Then we trained three models with uh, this policy gradient reinforce algorithm. One with ordinary reinforce, one with reinforce and a reward baseline, and one with maximum entropy reinforce. However, we found that if, if we just train from scratch, uh, our Gantrait model was not able to produce any higher reward um, trajectories. So what we did was we used a substantial amount of pre-training um, <clears throat> using cross-entropy minimization as a seed. So first we pre-trained and then we trained our models. Actually, we used the same seed for all the three different uh, Gantrait models. Okay, so moving on to the performance here um, of our four models. We know here the cross entropy of our function of our generators, the entropy of our generators, the mean reward as judged by the discriminator, and the standard deviation. So one thing we noticed directly was that all of our Gantrain model had a very low mean reward, uh, which means that actually the discriminator is, is dominating uh, this. GAN optimization. And we found that actually the maximum entropy had at its final state, at its, its final training iteration, uh, a zero reward, which is problematic. Uh, and it is probably like to uh, that when we add this entropy term, we are relatively weakening the importance of our reward. Uh, we did find that our maximum entropy reinforced agent had the highest entropy well, as set at the dispense of uh, the mean reward. Um, the cross entropy trained model had the lowest cross entropy, which is maybe not so surprising because it's directly optimizing this objective. So moving on to uh, the samples we could generate, which actually foiled the discriminator. I have a small excerpt of one that is fooling the, the discriminator. And uh, we can just listen to it. Going to go ahead and pause that because it actually, as we see here, it's repeating three times. Mm -hmm. And um, we did find a small motif with some variation. Uh, however, it's pretty repetitive um, in its nature. And this is due to the convolutional discriminator that is being used. And um, yes, moving on. Oh. So now we try to look at some of the samples that are uh, not very well. Um, so we found a sample like this here, where we see that there is a lot of repetition of the same nodes. And in order to analyze this result, we modeled the, uh, or we plotted the distribution of our policies at different time steps of our trajectory. So at different states of this uh, uh, rollout of trajectory. 
And we see here for time zero, five, 10, and 15. Um, and as we see here, the further we go down, we actually see that it's a, that only a few modes of our generative distribution are present. Uh, to see how uh, this was a phenom phenomena across a different gantry model, we selected the same uh, state from our and looked at the policy across the different models. So here we have again the concentrically trained, the reinforce agent, reinforce with reward baseline and maximum entropy reinforce. So one thing we notice is that all of our GAN models, uh, we, we see that we have only a few modes left in our generative distribution. And this is actually even the case for our maxim maximum entropy agent, which was supposed to fix this problem. Furthermore, we are seeing that this mode seems to coincide with their pre-trained seed uh, distribution. Um, so we hypothesized that uh, a problem, uh, our problem here is the, uh, the unpolicy nature of um, this reinforce algorithm. So let's say we are in uh, with a pol policy at iteration K and we want to update it. So we sample some trajectories according to uh, our policy. Then we have a reward. Now let's look at the how the update would look like. Uh, and this is regardless of it being maximum entropy or uh, the, just an ordinary reinforce. So we see here that if we have a high reward trajectory, we will make uh, the mode more likely, and we will also make uh, we will also make this trajectory less likely as it is uh, has a zero reward. However, if there are modes uh, of the reward distribution that are not being sampled, um, then we will simply not explore in this direction and we cannot learn to uh, generate in this uh, direction. And this seems especially to be a problem when we, are, when we need to use substantial amount of pre-training since we are already uh, settled on some initial distribution. Um, so moving on to our future work, uh, we found that our biggest problem was the low reward and the need of pre-training. So um, one thing we would like to consider is the number of tokens um, in our uh, used because it would um, it will make our variance of our trajectories uh, lower. Also, one thing that would be interesting is to look into getting rewards for unfinished sequences as uh, we could learn faster uh, what are unlikely samples and what are, uh, what are looking to be promising samples. Okay, so in conclusion, all our GAN trained models needed pre-training and uh, our maximum entropy reinforce agent it raised the entropy, but it did not fundamentally solve the mode drop challenges. Um, and we, uh, in this context, it seemed more adequate for fine tuning than to learn any new modes. And with that, I will say thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, we have some questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is from Jason who is asking, how does the generator decide when to stop, i.e. when to declare that it has completed a sequence, mm -hmm. where the sequence is simply a fixed length of measures? Um, I mean, in this context, we, we just uh, generate it onto a fixed length. And this, of course, limits the um, what can be generated only to fixed length sequences. Uh, we could, of course, use our generator to um, generate 
longer than it was trained on, but it was trained to generate fixed length sequences. And Jason, just put a follow up, or was the stop token one of the possible outputs of the MDP? Uh, no, not in this, not in this, but it is, of course, a possibility to look into that. But uh, for a discriminator, we also, um, even though it's not, you can, can design a disc your discriminator also to consider variable length sequences, but uh, in this context, we considered fixed level length. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas is asking perhaps a more fundamental question. Why do we use MERL instead of RL? In other words, why do we want to maximize entropy? Is it to encourage exploration of the policy space or is it something else? Yes, that's, that's, that was exactly our idea. Uh, because uh, in principle, if our, if our reinforce agent could just find one really, really good sample, then it could, um, then it could always generate that and uh, it would have the same effect as gener generating a wide variety of samples um, that were equally, equally likely to be, uh, yeah, real samples. So it is to encourage uh, generating of more diverse samples. Thank you. And uh, another question from Iris. Have you checked if the high reward pieces pirated any pieces in the original data set? And what are the songs in the original data set um, are the most similar to it that inspired the generation? Um, that is definitely on our to-do list to go more into uh, an anal analysis of this. We, we did not yet carry out any experiments to see if there is some uh, plagiarism. plagiarism. Uh -huh. Okay, Matthias, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, me. and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Um, let us move on to our next presentation, which is from uh, Liam Dallas and Fabio Moriale. And uh, their paper is entitled Effects of Added Vocals and Human Production to AI Composed Music on Listeners' Appreciation. Liam, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all feeling well and have been enjoying the presentation so far. I know I have. My name is Liam Dallas, and I've done this paper as part of my postgraduate study at the University of Auckland's School of Music uh, with supervision of Fabio Moriale. So we are thinking about how people listen to music and especially non-musicians, how they listen to music. And we are hypothesizing that non-musicians especially listen to the vocals, particularly when they are present. And while we are listening to AI music, we notice there's a distinguishable lack of vocals. A lot of systems are capturing vocal timbres and cadences, but there's very little of what we'd um, call language. But vocals being not the only human part of a piece of music, there are other options such as um, the instrumentalists and the producer. So we came up with some hypotheses and that would be that number one, and this is the most important to us, tracks with vocals would be more enjoyable than those without. And a second hypothesis is produced tracks would be more enjoyable than AI tracks. So our experiment we came up with was to have AI write complete pieces. And these are gonna be pop rock style pieces. And it's gonna start with an AI track developed with um, just instrumental. And then we're gonna produce these with live instruments and production elements and have an AI system write lyrics, have a singer perform vocal parts for this and then put them together and we can have four modes now. We can have the AI backing track. Here it says the AVA backing track as that's the system we used. We can have that with vocals or with no vocals. Then we can have the produced version with live instruments and production with vocals or with no vocals. So with four different compositions and all these four modes, we end up with 16 total tracks. 
So once we have these tracks, we are going to present them to people. We sought ethical approval from the University of Auckland's Ethics Board for a online survey, and we'd separate people into four groups so that each participant would hear one of each mode and one of each composition. And when they hear these, they are then asked to rate them on five scales labeled with one to seven of enjoyable, emotional, unique, memorable, and overall quality. And then they also have the opportunity to leave qualitative comments on how and why they answered this the way they did. So we can have some insight into the results we receive. So we are mostly going to this looking at enjoyable, but enjoyable is not the only pe way people relate to music. So we found these other scales and in hope we could get more insight into why or find some other results we weren't expecting. So going on to how we composed these pieces using AI systems. The main goal was to have as little human input as possible. And that had some difficulties to get full of pop rock style pieces because we couldn't find anything that would do both the music as in the instruments, the arrangement and such, and the lyrics. So instead we had to use different systems. And to have systems that work together, they must have to fit a structure so they can overlay. For a lyric generation system, we used a um, online source, these lyrics do not exist.com. We used this mostly because for all the lyric generation systems that provided structured outputs in a verse chorus style format, this was the one that required least input from the user. It required simply a genre and a mood selection. These were all neutral pop songs and it also required a single word to act as its source. And to make it un... So that the participants did not find anything odd, we used love as the source. So seeing multiple love songs is not going to make you think something odd about it. Whereas if there were two songs about sausages, you might have some ideas. The participants going into this had no idea what was being tested. They were simply presented with pieces of music and asked for their comment. So for backing tracks, instrumental backing tracks, we found Ava worked really well because it generated AB format music that can we, we can then map A's to verses and B's to choruses. So we would generate an Ava backing track. We would generate a set of lyrics. We would overlay uh, to each B section we would overlay a chorus and to each A section we'd add a sequential verse from the same piece. If however, on some of the pieces this happened, there were too many A sections um, for, for verses that were generated, we generated another with the same set and took those verses to fill out the arrangement. Then for putting these two pieces together, if we have our instrumental tracks and we have lyrics, to put the melody on top, we need something to write a melody. And although there are plenty of melodic writing tools available that can write for a specific text or that can write for a specific harmony, we couldn't find something that would set a specific text to a given harmony. So we uh, wrote our own one and it's, nothing particularly uh, stellar. It's based off my approaches to writing melodies. So it comes with, I guess, inbuilt my um, ideas about music. So I can't really have time to describe how it all works, but feel free to ask questions about it if you're interested later. So with the melody, backing track lyrics all sorted and written, we could record them. We got a vocalist in and created all four modes of the separate compositions. So here you can listen to some of the music we've got here. So this is not going to be a full track. This is an excerpt from one of the pieces. It is most of the piece, but for time's sake, it is not finished. And it's going to switch between two of our modes. It's going to start with the AI version, the Ava backing track with no vocals. And it's going to swap every four bars to the produced version, which does contain the vocals. You know 
Oop, it has stops. Hold on. Love, you take these people, oh yeah. You know love is the only one. But love is stronger at the end of the line. With a smile coming back to me. So that was the piece that was aptly named uh, Track 3. <laughs> and it shows some of the advantages and disadvantages in the, um, the text setting algorithm that we developed. Um, some of the disadvantages I'll just quickly touch on. Um, it doesn't analyze language cadences. So the delivery can sound a bit unnatural and it can end up placing emphasis on beats that you wouldn't net on sorry on syllables that you wouldn't naturally place emphasis on with regards to the language it doesn't support anacrusis or suspension meaning none of the melodies can start before the beat uh, before beat one of the bar sorry and it can't start on a dissonant note or a non-chord tone and it doesn't consider the ease of singing some of the pieces, especially if you go and listen to some of the other ones we recorded, have very difficult singing parts um, with tritone leaps and changing harmonies with very fast quaver rhythms. That thank you very much to our singer Jonathan Meyer who uh, put up with having to sing all of these. But it's got some good advantages. This system too, that it doesn't specify an octave and that means we can assign it to a singer and we can adapt it to their vocal range. If, if we got a female singer, it can just be sung up the octave. If it's a male singer down the octave, if they can't hit a high G, for example, we can drop it down an octave. And it's adaptive to key movement. This was important when working with the Ava backing tracks, um, seeing as they used lots of non-diatonic chords and key changes. So, if you want to listen to any more tracks, there's the link on the screen and you can listen to all four of the compositions and all four of the modes. But uh, let's touch on the results of our study now. So looking at our hypotheses to start off, remember the most important one, the tracks with vocals would be more enjoyable than those without. And we got a significant result, which is awesome. But less, and less awesome was that the vocals tracks were less enjoyable and lower in overall quality based on our scores. You can see the means and the graph up on screen for the enjoyable vocals. Also, the vocals were considered to be more unique, but we did not find any significant dif differences with production versus AI instruments or between musicians and non-musicians, which was one of our sort of conceptual ideas we wanted to start on, but we got our participants to self-identify as musicians or non-musicians. And this meant that over some of the groups, our um, numbers in some of the musician or non-musician categories were just spread too thin to get any reliable results. So why were the vocals tracks less enjoyable? Um, we had almost a hundred comments on the forms where we gave them the option of leaving some comments as to why they answered. And you might think it's to do with vocal delivery if it was less enjoyable with vocals, but out of the 100 comments, only two mentioned vocal quality. But a third of them, over 30, um, mentioned 
the lyrics and the poor quality of the lyrics with no prompts. So we vastly underestimated the importance of lyrics in contemporary music. And especially if we think about the prevalence of hip hop in popular culture, lyrics there are of prime importance. And someone actually left a great comment that I think very aptly describes what's going on here. And despite their <laughs> lack of knowledge of what was actually happening, has great insight. And that was this one. It sounds like an alien observing mankind and tried to make a sad garage rock song. Which I think is great because the both the music generation system and the lyric generation were machine learning algorithms. And this is exactly what they do. They observe us and then they try find what's important and emulate it. And it's funny to see that someone picked out that was happening and it might mean there's something inherently i'm not going to continue that one <laughs> i'm unsure where that was going anyway well other things no difference on produced tracks to ai tracks with regards to the um instruments and that's a bit unfortunate as the one who produced it myself i was really hoping that the produced ones would do better but that's all right. We had a lot of restrictions due to COVID. Unfortunately, the university studios were closed. So all these tracks had to be produced right in this room right here. And our singer had to record remotely. We couldn't have them tracking in a studio um, or with immediate feedback. And with uh, not a lack of funding, we were not able to hire professional session musicians or a professional producer, which obviously would have made these perform better. But on a good note, this really shows how good the AI systems are becoming at making music that might appeal to a mainstream audience. Um, as someone who has a bachelor in music and has been working on producing music, to have an AI um, match my level of enjoyability in these particular compositions is really promising for the field of music and AI. So in our investigation onto the impact of human vocals, we stumbled on the huge importance of lyrics. And we propose that lyric generation is one of the most important areas of future development for music composed entirely by AI, if it is to be aimed at mainstream audiences. So with this um, study, there could be lots of variations we could consider moving forwards. Um, one that is immediately present would be to use human lyricists. This would remove the roadblock of these bad AI lyrics, which if you listen out to some of the pieces, you can definitely tell there's some weird stuff going on in the lyrics. Other options, we could use singing voice synthesis systems. Um, this way we could have both the AI tracks and the human tracks um, have the lyrical content and thus we could isolate the um, human voice as an instrument better rather than the higher level content that comes along associated with lyrics. And of course, as with any study, the option of upscaling with session musicians, professional producers, and more participants can always bring to light more information that wasn't available in a smaller study. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. And back to you, Stephen, for if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Liam. Very interesting. Just, um, we've got some comments by uh, Bob. Um, who has um, observed that um, the music that you played sounds like what he calls a song poem, and he's put a Wikipedia definition uh, which reads that song poems are songs with lyrics by usually non-professional writers that have been set to music by commercial companies for a fee. This practice, which has long been disparaged in the established music industry, was also known as song sharking and was conducted by several businesses throughout the 20th century in North America. Uh, and Bob says, which means I love them. Um, um, I mean, and then Roger's following on with uh, an observation and a question. Um, what about comparing vocalese, say vowel sounds, with an instrument playing the same melodic line, worth keeping a different evaluations, emotion, interest, etc., between individuals rather than all done by each person, if that's what you did? Hmm. It's very interesting, just on the thing of the uh, song poems or whatever. Um, that's very much sort of what's going on here, is we are taking these lyrics that 
miss a lot of higher level structures that a professional songwriter might have. And we are trying to fit them into a musical structure that has been provided by um, uh, artificial intelligence, which this sort of brings to light the conclusion we found as well, which is that the lyrics are definitely the thing that's lacking as compared to the purely what you might think of as musical, though I would definitely um, argue that the lyrics are part of the music, but the notes and the harmony is what I'm talking about here, um, are at a much higher level than the language systems are currently if we are looking at music. And sorry, what was the second? Just to, just to recap that, Liam. Uh, so Roger is saying, what about comparing vocalese, say vowel sounds, with an instrument playing the same melodic line and work keeping, Roger adds, work keeping the different evaluations, emotion, interest, etc., between individuals rather than all done by each person, if that's what you did. Mm, that's interesting, using um, the human voice more as an instrument than as a sort of a carrier of language. And it touches on two things, I think there. One, you could relate this to sort of um, the practice of scat, which is using your voice as an instrument. And some people I know have strong opinions about disliking this, but I'm sure lots of people like it too. And I think that brings with it a lot of cultural background that you're not prepared for um, bringing that in. But it could definitely be very interesting just examining the use of the voice as an instrument and trying to isolate that apart from AI and just having the timbres and characteristics of vocals. And with uh, regards to the other thing that I mentioned was, I don't think the human voice can be very well detached from language, um, especially if we're aiming at mainstream audiences where that is what the voice is used for. The voice is for language, that's how we move it. And anytime we hear someone's voice, our brain will be subconsciously trying to find words in it, even if there are none to be present. I suppose just uh, with a devil's advocate response, Liam, um, there are many who argue that there is a continuum between music and language, um, and that texted singing music is at one end of the continuum, and at the other end are such forms of vocalization such as mother infant singing, where mm. a mother will sing to her infant um, in a kind of uh, what's called sometimes mother ease, uh, entirely non-verbal sometimes, uh, and the infant clearly is hardwired to respond to it. So I, I do think I do think human beings are very good at responding to wordless vocalizations, um, and I think we stop extracting the uh, the semantic content and the syntactic content, and I think we then start to latch uh, on the emotive. Um, and the kind of affiliative dimension whereby we are drawn to the person who is who is uttering those vocalizations um, and we feel kind of uh, emotionally connected rather than maybe um, cognitively connected. Yeah, that's very interesting. There's a, there's a lot that could be explored there. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. And yeah, uh, there's some really good points there. There's just, there's so much to cover, mostly though from a philosophical standpoint, more than a um, musical or a um, scientific standpoint. Mm. Just one, and time is getting on a little bit, but just one further further point. Um, clearly, um, there was a perception that the lyrics were not particularly high quality. Hmm. Have, you, have you considered the question whereby important words in the lyrics are aligned with certain harmonies and certain metrical positions because sometimes a really expressive lyric with beautiful words and very heartfelt sentiments can be rendered trite and crass if it if it's aligned poorly with a melodic line or if it fits awkwardly uh, against the meter of the song or against uh, the harmonic progression Oh, for sure. And we didn't consider that in this study. Um, we could have tried to, for sure. Um, but 
we were not looking for lyrical content. The lyrical content importance came out um, just out of circumstance because the lyrical content came in such a bad way. <laughs> but yes, as you say, lots of other options for future development of that study. So Liam, thank you very much. Really interesting. Um, thank you. And our final presentation in this session uh, is a work in progress talk uh, by Satira Chakraborty, uh, Shyam Kishore Shubnam Nikesh Patil and Joseph Timoney, um, entitled Leader STEM, an LSTM model for dynamic leader identification within musical streams. Um, we do have Satira with us, um, but he has some uh, internet connectivity problems. So I believe Bob is going to um, play a pre-recorded version of the presentation and then Satira, Satira can uh, take questions uh, afterwards. Hi everyone, this is Shutirtho doing my doctoral research at Merit University. I would also like to mention the co-authors of this paper, Sham Kishore working in Genpak, Bangalore, India, Shubham Patil studying at SVNIT India and Dr. Joseph Timoney, my supervisor at Menuth University. Today I will be presenting our paper Leader STEM, a LSTM model for dynamic leader identification within musical streams. A music ensemble is a collaborative performance by musicians and singers. Music offers a unique abstract way for expression of human emotions and moods wherein the melodic harmonies achieved through pitch, rhythm, tempo, texture and other sonic qualities. The emerging area of robot musicianship focuses on the development of machine intelligence in terms of algorithms and cognitive models to capture the underlying principles of musical perception, composition and performance. To explicitly perform, the key ingredients of a good symphony are synchronization and anticipation which means understanding the beats and identifying and following the correct leader. One of the major characteristics of a musical performance is that musicians do not engage with rigidity. Rather than they play, move and act as per the feel of the music. Further, the role of different musicians in an orchestra changes following a rhythm communicated in real time either through mutual non-verbal gestures or by a principal conductor. Thus, there is a smooth transition of the musicians between the role of leader and follower. Each musician is connected to every other musician during the process indirectly or directly representing the whole system as a connected graph. The two essential features of the communication would be mainly auditory response and the nonverbal expressions. The auditory response help the musician to understand the musical part. At the same time, the gesture boosts up the expression and the feeling in the performance. Over the years, the researcher had been studying both audio and nonverbal aspects together to decode the underlying physics of human synchronization and group performance where time plays an important role such as this kind of musical activity. However, in this paper, we tried to explore machine learning models and their potentials to understand and follow a dynamic leader who keep changing over the time of the performance using audio features only. This result would be especially useful in an analysis of scenario where there is no video or eye tracking or gestural data available, but only the audio data, which is often the case. To simulate an ensemble performance in this experiment, we used a STEM dataset, the MSU DB18 dataset, which consists of total 150 complete music tracks. These are of distinct genres that contains mix of vocal, drums, bass and other accompanied instruments. All the tracks are stereophonic as well as sampled at 44,100 Hz. As we can see on the left hand side top image, 
The data set consists of a full mix track divided into four stems or individual instrument subtracts, the drum, bass, other accompaniment and voice. We used PyAudio's Python library to capture live audio buffers and used Obvious beat tracking, pitch and amplitude functions to generate tempo, pitch and volume from each audio buffers. We extracted this for each stems and the full mix track in real time with a window size of 1024 and a half size of 512. From the table down below we can see that we have 12 input features and one target output feature. We took a sample file and tried to visualize it. In the initial stage, the mixture follows the other accompanied instrument and then it follows the drum and lastly it follows the bass. Around the samples of 8000 to 12000, there is a significant change in tempo. Around 8000, there is a significant lowering of tempo and around 12000, there is a significant increase in the tempo. So we can consider this file to be a good test case to check the maximum potential of the machine learning model which we develop called leader stem. In this experiment, we split our dataset into two halves, training and testing with a ratio of 8 is to 2. Then we find possible correlation in the set of features we used principal component analysis or PCA and observe the cumulative value of the variance as shown in figure on the right hand side. It reaches 1 when all the features are included, so we had to use all the features to build our model. Initially we explored the three different models. These are random forest, support vector machine or SVM and long short term memory or the LSTM. On evaluating these three machine learning models, we find that the two layered LSTM performs much better than the other SVM and random forest. The metric we used for evaluation of the performance was mean squared error or MSC. After seeing the performance of a two-layered LSTM model very good, we expanded our search on three-layered, four-layered and five-layered LSTM models to find the optimal and the best leader stem model. To achieve this, we used the rate tuner for hypertuning. We set the learning rate from 0 0.001 to 0.1, the number of nodes in the hidden layer from 2 to 512, the number of hidden layers 3, 4 and 5. The activation function we used here was ReLU. For each model we ran 10 epochs and the batch size was 32. Finally we get the best model which had the learning rate of 0 0.82 and the unit 1, 2, 3 was 445, 481 and 37 respectively which gave a mean squared error of 245. Lastly, when we use the LSTM model for prediction, we see the first part follows the vocal, which was unlikely with the test dataset, marked with red color on the slide. The second part follows the drum and the others accompaniment, which partially matches with the output dataset. And the last part, it follows the base similar to the test dataset. So from this model, we can understand LSTM models like leader stem can be used to understand and identify the leader correctly. The model was able to understand the time varying leadership during the performance and also was able to follow the leader correctly from the pitch, volume and tempo features. It was also able to add up sudden tempo changes like in the middle of the song when the BPM of the song suddenly drops down and again rises up. Thus this work shows us how to use the stem dataset for simulating an ensemble performance. The leader stem model can be useful for robot human interaction scenarios that requires a real time BPM analysis to understand the leader. For future work. We will try to expand the search space, also incorporate visual gaze and body sway along with audio features 
to detect appropriate litter. Thank you very much. Okay, we should be back. You ready to go? Thank you very much, Satirka. And um, we have no questions just yet. Um, may I start perhaps by asking you, um, does your model have a perhaps a, a more general applicability to the topic of auditory scene analysis? In other words, how, how human beings perceive a complex environment with multiple sound sources, uh, which might be moving in relation to each other with different perceived amplitudes and different perceived tempi. Um, it, it seems that when we are in a, a, a musical environment, listening to who is leading and who is following, that represents a kind of auditory scene analysis. For for this experiment, uh, as if now the model won't be able to do that, but uh, I think that that's a good point to you know explore and train the model on depending upon the position of the the you know the re the receiver and and how they react to what type of sounds for 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 this particular kind of data set the sounds are you know in in perfect shape and in proper way so I don't think it will be able to do that. You know, in a better way, but yeah, surely we we can work on that. So, in terms of testing it on different sized ensembles, mm -hmm. have you have you uh, experimented to see how how effective it, it it is at discriminating larger ensembles than, for example, a a, a pop rock style combo? Uh, for as if now for uh, no. So basically, we are trying to do some experiment uh, on our lab, but due to the lockdown, you know, everything got closed, and uh, we we need needed to find some alternative uh, ensemble simulation data sets, uh, which we, which was easy to you know do do run this type of simulation. So that's uh, that that uh, so we we found this uh, MSD uh, MSD DB18, which is mainly used for so, you know vocal isolation or you know. Uh, for instrument isolation, so we you try to modify that into some real time scenario using the beat tracking and the pitch and the volume, and try to replicate the whole ensemble scenario for for this purpose. Thank you. Um, Roger has a question. Um, he's asking, I missed what was the core of your definition, the ground truth of which part was leading when. Are you able to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So basically for our ground truth, we, we consider that um, uh, the, the, there was a mixer track and there were four uh, stem tracks. So the mixer track, uh, the, the, the BPM from the mi mixer track was our ground truth. And we, we, we relied that, you know, what, whatever is the mixer track giving us, the mixer track contains the, all the instruments together. So it's like the full song. So the, what, whatever output uh, it, it, it was generating from, from the beat tracking algorithm, we kept track of uh, all the bits for each samples. So that was our ground to in believing that the beat tracking algorithm and then, uh, then for each stems, we we took out you know di uh, different um, uh, the 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 BPM for different uh, different uh, each samples, and then we tried to relate each other. So basically, the ground truth was the mixture track uh, beat samples. Does that answer the question, um, Roger? Is that uh, do you have a follow up to that, Roger? Well, it sounds more like beat the tempo coordination than what I thought you were getting at, which is kind of an instrument guiding a change in tempo. Yeah, it, it's kind of that. 
So is there an application of this technology to, to generation in terms of um, creating a more natural uh, feeling of ensemble give and take uh, when, a, when a system is generating multi-part, multi-instrument type music? So yeah, so if you try to you know make some uh, human, um, some robot to perform with humans, so it's a very key thing so that uh, that the robot tries to understand the humans who are playing different instruments and whom to focus on. Like you know, to the sometimes in the song there is no drum and the vocals and the the bass is playing together. So at that time, if the robot tries to you know concentrate on the drums, so it will get null values. So in that kind of scenario we we need this type of models to predict like whom to follow if if the drum if, if the bass and the drums are having similar uh, kind of uh, you know the bpms then it will try to you know rely on that value because it has a more strong uh, you know uh, possibilities to be the correct um, or, you know bpm so in that case uh, th this kind of model will help the robot to decide whom to follow and um, yeah of course uh, we haven't tried with you know many other instruments that will be a, a key thing to you know observe and how the how the model works okay thank you very much thank very you interesting. Um, and that um, is our final paper in this session so thank you very much to all our presenters uh, and we can be again at 1600 uh, for our next 